Welcome back to Investigate Joe Rogan. Today I will be looking at episode 1535 with Tim Kennedy. This is the podcast where I fact check and investigate the Joe Rogan experience. I don't have much to say about the new studio that hasn't already been said by various people on the internet, but I do think that he should have just gone for it more and just had the whole studio completely bathed in red light and had a sort of uh, Nicholas Winding Refn aesthetic. I think that could have been interesting. Now, the first thing I'll talk about is uh, Rogan says that they can clone people, they being China. Now, can they clone people? Can anyone clone people? The answer is nobody knows for sure, but there's sort of good reason to think that they might be able to. It's a little bit complicated. In 2013, some scientists in America, led by a man named... Shukrat Mitalipov, whose name I have mispronounced, successfully cloned human embryos. However, they never tried actually putting those cloned embryos into women to try and have them give birth to clones. Then, five years later, in 2018, some scientists in China, led by Ji Tsun and Zhen Lu, whose names I have also mispronounced, cloned monkey embryos, and then actually transferred those embryos and had live clone births. Live cloned monkey births. So you can clone human embryos, and monkeys can take cloned monkey embryos and end up with cloned monkey babies. But as far as the general public is aware, at least, nobody has actually done it with humans. Some people have claimed to have cloned humans, however, but nobody has any proof. The Raelians, for instance, who are a cult, claim that aliens told them to start cloning people. And so they actually tried, but then the government told them to stop. But they did not stop. They moved to the Bahamas and continued. And supposedly, they successfully created 14 clones. Nobody really believes them, though, since they won't let anyone actually see these clones, which is a little bit suspicious. But you never know. They could have clones. But China could seriously have cloning uh, technology. It's just not really known for sure. After that, they talk about Texas for a while. And what I find funny is that both of these guys are from California. And if you go on the internet and look at discussion about this whole Californians moving to Texas phenomenon that they discuss, pretty much all you'll find is native Texans telling them to get out and stay out. (laughs) They do not seem to like people moving to Texas. And I just find that funny. But anyway, on to 9-11. Tim Kennedy says that 9-11 was the result of insurgents trying to bring down capitalism and freedom. But is this really the case? What were the actual motivations behind 9-11? Well, if you look at what Osama bin Laden actually wrote and said, you can find out, or at least you can get a pretty good idea. It's thought that there are sort of four big reasons. In his so-called Letter to America, in which he laid out his reasons for 9-11, he wrote that, quote, the creation of Israel is a crime which must be erased. Each and every person whose hands have become polluted in the contribution towards this crime must pay its price and pay for it heavily. And then he goes on to write, the aim of the United States is also to serve the Jews' petty state and divert attention from its occupation of Jerusalem and murder of Muslims there, The best proof of this is their eagerness to destroy Iraq, the strongest neighboring Arab state, and their endeavor to fragment all the states of the region such as Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Sudan into paper statelets, and through their disunion and weakness to guarantee Israel's survival and the continuation of the brutal crusade occupation of the peninsula. 
So we can see here that the U.S.'s support of Israel was clearly a big reason. On a side note, I like the term statelet, and I think that it's a funny word. Osama bin Laden also seems to have been motivated by the economic sanctions placed on Iraq uh, in 1998. He wrote, quote, The Americans are once again trying to repeat the horrific massacres as though they are not content with the protracted blockade imposed after the ferocious war or the fragmentation and devastation. On that basis and in compliance with Allah's order, we issue the following fatwa to all Muslims, the ruling to kill Americans and their allies, civilians and military, is an individual duty for every Muslim. So here he directly connects that to, uh, you know, the jihad. And then just in general, uh, he was very opposed to the U.S. military being stationed uh, in the Middle East, specifically in Saudi Arabia, um, and the U.S. military picking sides in various Middle Eastern conflicts. Uh, in that same 1998 fatwa, he wrote, For over seven years, the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of places, the Arabian Peninsula, plundering its riches, dictating to its rulers, humiliating its people, terrorizing its neighbors, and turning its bases in the peninsula into a spearhead through which to fight the neighboring Muslim peoples. And then later on, he writes, quote, You attacked us in Somalia. You supported the Russian atrocities against us in Chechnya, the Indian oppression against us in Kashmir, and the Jewish aggression against us in Lebanon. We also advise you to stop supporting Israel and to end your support of the Indians in Kashmir, the Russians against the Chechens, and to also cease supporting the Manila government against the Muslims in southern Philippines. Now, the closest thing you'll get to Osama bin Laden saying he did it because he hates our freedom and capitalism is this quote, um, which is also from his so-called Letter to America. The second thing we call you to is to stop your oppression, lies, immorality, and debauchery that has spread among you. We call you to be a people of manners, principles, honor, and purity, to reject the immoral acts of fornication, homosexuality, intoxicants, gambling, and trading with interest. Now, obviously, uh, you know, this is incredibly ironic that he is, uh, you know, calling us to principles and honor. Uh, while being a big fan of killing random civilians. Um, but this isn't really hating freedom. It's just hating things that Muslims uh, think are sins, including trading with interest. That's not an economic thing. It's not a critique of capitalism. That's just considered a sin in Islam, as it is in uh, Judaism as well. Now, I've quoted Osama bin Laden a lot here. And I'm probably on a government watch list now. But hopefully I've gotten my point across. 9-11 was not about freedom and capitalism or, you know, these sorts of vague things. Osama bin Laden seems to have been motivated by specific U.S. actions in the Middle East. To illustrate this idea, imagine an alternate universe where the U.S., does all of the things Osama bin Laden takes issue with here, but is also socialist. And I'm, I'm not talking like, you know, Sweden, like welfare state. I'm talking like hard socialism. Would Osama bin Laden care about that? It doesn't seem like he would. He doesn't really t talk about it. Or imagine an alternate universe where the U.S. does all these things but has very little freedom. Imagine a U.S. with no freedom of speech. You can't criticize the government. You can't protest. Uh, you can't pick whatever religion you want. You can't buy guns, etc. Would 9-11 still have happened? Are any of these really things that Osama bin Laden seems to care about? Not really. Now, here's another hypothetical scenario. Imagine a world where the U.S. does not do any of the things that Osama bin Laden takes issue with. We don't support Israel. We don't have any sort of special relationship with them. 
We don't have any sort of military presence in the Middle East. We haven't taken any sides, any Middle Eastern conflicts. We don't do any of that. Does 9-11 still happen in this universe? Yeah, you know, I hate to sort of victim blame here, because, I mean, ultimately, there's only one person whose fault this is, and it's Osama bin Laden. But I'm pretty sure 9-11 would not happen in this alternate universe. Now, Tim Kennedy actually goes hard in the opposite direction and says that if the U.S. had invaded Afghanistan in 1999, that 9-11 wouldn't have happened. <laughs> he doesn't explain why, um, but based on Osama bin Laden's opinions here, I highly doubt it. Later on, he says more stuff about the war on terror that weirdly sort of contradicts all of this. For instance, he says that Afghanistan uh, can never be governed and that we could pull out of Afghanistan. And then he also says that it's hard to prevent 9-11s when you're, quote, creating vacuums for evil to fill, which almost makes it seem like he's really close to realizing why the war on terror has been bad. I mean, that's like the classic war on terror and general U.S. foreign policy criticism. So he's, it sort of seems like he might be on to something here, but who knows. I also find it interesting, just sort of as a side note, that he says the whole situation is no different than a person, which is interesting because that's how Jocko talks about the situation as well. These people, they seem to see countries as being single people, like the anime Hitalia. They continue to talk about 9-11, and an hour and 16 minutes in, Tim Kennedy says, quote, I volunteered on 9-11 because of this. He says this when they're talking about 9-11 uh, and people having to jump out of the windows. And this is a straight-up lie. According to U.S. Army Ranger Association Annual Ranger Muster 2010, Tim Kennedy enlisted in 2004. It says, quote, Kennedy attended Eagle Academy Private High School, graduating in 1998. He then attended Columbia College, Columbia, Missouri, earning a BA in criminal justice in 2002. Kennedy began competing in sanctioned mixed martial arts fights while still in college, but after graduation, Kennedy enlisted in the U.S. Army on January 4th, 2004, and attended basic combat training, advanced individual training, basic airborne course, and the Special Forces Qualification Course, and Ranger School. So in fact, in 2001, Tim Kennedy was just in college, and he didn't join the Army until 2004. So why would he lie about when he joined the military? Well, obviously it sounds cooler and more badass if you say you joined on the day of 9-11, you know? Like in American Sniper, that scene where Chris Kyle is, uh, he's watching the news and he sees 9-11. So Tim Kennedy wants to paint this picture that he just, he got right up off his couch the day of and just marched himself down to the recruitment office. And this sort of gets into a larger problem with neocons, which is that they don't think that lying is bad. They believe that lying is okay if it furthers their goals of continuing the war and promoting nationalism and national unity and this sort of thing. So it's hard to trust what they say. It's hard to trust what Tim Kennedy says if he is willing to lie about something like this. I mean, how can we trust this guy? Honestly, I find the fact that he would lie about this pretty sickening. They continue to talk about terrorism, and Tim Kennedy says that China and Russia are funding radical Islamic terrorism and Antifa. And this statement is sort of a, a mixed bag. There's no evidence that China sponsors Islamic terrorism. In fact, there have been some pretty bad Islamic terrorist attacks in China, so they probably don't want to sponsor them. 
Russia, on the other hand, probably does sponsor uh, some Muslim terrorists, or at least they probably did in the past. It's not necessarily confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, but it's a pretty safe bet. Now, there's no evidence that either of these countries fund Antifa. I mean, what <laughs> what would these funds even be for? I mean, like bricks, black sweatshirts. Even guns aren't something that the average person can't afford to buy. Seeing somebody with a gun does not make me think that there must be some sort of conspiracy at work or that this person must be uh, funded by a foreign government. Maybe people who don't live in America don't know about this, but guns aren't expensive. They are certainly not prohibitively expensive. Even, uh, you know, sort of the classic, uh, now sort of infamous AR-15, which gets lots of attention, is not so expensive that an average person couldn't buy it. Also on the subject of Russian interference, Tim Kennedy says that Russia did not want Trump to win. They didn't care who won. Now, if this is true, why did they only have bots and trolls and things supporting Trump? Personally, I don't think that this Russian propaganda stuff, you know, swung the election or anything. But I don't think you can say that Russia didn't care who won. They clearly wanted Trump to win. Now, speaking of Trump, they talk about the debate. And I will say, I genuinely think a Joe Rogan Experience 2020 presidential debate would be superior to the one we will end up getting. And in case you are unaware, Tim Kennedy tweeted about this after this episode came out, and Trump actually responded on Twitter and said that he would be down to do this. Now, as we all know by now, Trump saying something on Twitter does not necessarily mean that that thing will come to pass. Um, <laughs> Biden also has not responded at all. So, I mean, it doesn't look like it will actually happen, but I hope it does. And if it does, I will be investigating it. Weirdly enough, during this presidential discussion, Tim Kennedy said that he liked Tulsi Gabbard, despite the fact that she has the exact opposite opinions as he does. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is Tim Kennedy says that California has less penalties for pedos and they recently changed a law to legalize pedophilia, and in California you can have sex with 10-year-olds and all this crazy stuff. And what he is referring to is California Senate Bill 145, or 145, however you say bill numbers. And pretty much nothing he said about it is true. So under the previous law, judges in California had the ability to not put people of certain ages on the sex offender list if they had engaged in vaginal intercourse with a minor who is above the age of 14 and within a 10-year age range of themselves. So you don't automatically become a sex offender. The judge can prevent this. It is still illegal to do these things, but you might not end up on the sex offender list. So the most extreme example of this would be a 24 year old could have consensual sex with a 14 year old and it is technically possible for a judge in the state of california to not put this person on the sex offender list i don't know if there are actual instances of this happening i could not find any but it is possible for this to happen now, what the law is actually designed to do is prevent, say, a 19-year-old who has consensual sex with a 17-year-old from ending up as a registered sex offender for life. And the new bill that Tim Kennedy brings up extends this whole principle to non-vaginal sex. That's it. Pedophilia isn't legalized. 
can't have sex with 10 year olds. That's all that has changed. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether or not this is a good law or whether this whole law should exist. But what Tim Kennedy said about it is not correct. That's all I have to say about this episode. That is a, a fun note to end on all around. This was uh, just a very fun episode. Thank you for listening to this fun episode. Obviously, there was a bit of a, a bit of a gap between this and the last episode. But I think the next episode should be sooner. I'll probably do the Edward Snowden one. And I will see you next time.